Hey guys, Miss Marusik here, and in this video, we're going to talk about Half-Life. Now, we saw a little preview to Half-Life in our previous video where we discussed integrated rate laws, because one of the things that we did with our integrated formulas is actually calculate the time of the Half-Life. What we're going to do in this video is kind of a bigger discussion on what Half-Life really actually represents, um, and we're also going to look at some other formulas that I could use with regards to Half-Life. So to start us off here, half Half-life is the time it takes for one half of the original substance, our original reactant, to change into something new, into some kind of product. Now, half-life times could be anywhere from fractions of seconds up to years. It just kind of depends on what reaction you're dealing with and how fast the rate of that reaction is. The faster that reaction progresses, the shorter the half-life time will be. Um, so let's say for a particular reaction, whatever its half-life time may be, um, one half-life has passed of that time. And so what happens is after that time frame, only one half or 50% of the sample will remain unchanged as our original reactant. And the other half, the other 50% will have changed into something new, whatever our product ends up being. Now, let's say a second half-life time passes. So now what happens is that original unchanged substance, that original reactant, I'm going to cut this in half again. And so when I cut it in half again, I end up with only a quarter or 25% of it that remains unchanged. The other three quarters or 75% has changed into something new. Well, again, let's say I go through yet another half-life. So now this reactant that's already been cut quite a bit is going to get cut in half again. So after three half-lives, only one-eighth or 12.5% remains unchanged, and the other seven-eighths or 87.5% changed into something new. So you can see that could go on and on and on for however many half-lives you have. And so over time, that amount of product that you have is going to increase tremendously, and the amount of reactant that you have is going to decrease tremendously. So the biggest implication with half-life deals with our orders kind of a throwback to our previous video. And that is the fact that if I have a zero order reaction, that they have decreasing half-life times. What that means is as the reaction progresses, the time it takes to cut in half gets shorter and shorter. And we see that here on this particular graph. This is a concentration versus time graph for a zero order reaction. And you notice that we are starting with a concentration of 0.2. If I cut that in half, that would put me down to 0.1. And so that has a particular time frame associated with it. Well, if I want to cut that 0.1 in half again, that would bump me down to 0.05. And I see to go from 0.1 to 0.05 takes this amount of time that's much shorter than what it took to half the first time. And so that's where that decreasing half-life time comes into play. Um, our first order reactions have a constant half-life time, which is really convenient. It stays the same throughout the course of the reaction. Um, it's convenient because that enables us to have an equation that we could always use to calculate the half-life time wherever in the reaction we're at. So here we see uh, a graph of concentration versus time for a first order reaction. And we see as I go from 0.2 down to 0.1, that takes a certain amount of time. But if I cut that 0.1 in half down to 0.05, I can see that it took the same amount of time to cut in half the second time or the third time or keep on going from there. Um, finally, on a second order reaction, they have increasing half-life times. So if I look at my uh, concentration versus time graph for a second order reaction, what we'll notice is the first halving from 0.2 down to 0.1 is really short. But then as I go from 0.1 down to 0.05, that got a little bit longer. And as I would go from 0.05 to say 0.025, halving that again, that half-life time gets even longer. Uh, this is the reason why on a lot of the problems that we saw uh, last video, uh, we looked at calculating the initial 
half-life time. What was the half-life at the very beginning of the reaction? And the reason why they specified that was because if we had a zero order or a second order reaction, that half-life time would change as the reaction progressed. And so that's why we needed to be very clear that we were trying to calculate that for what it was initially and not later on in the reaction. Now, another place that we see using this a whole bunch is when we're talking about radioactive decay. Um, these equations might look familiar from pre-P chemistry. Uh, this is where we are taking some sort of isotope that's very large and undergoing a decay process, either with an alpha particle or a beta particle or some other kind of particle being released. And so that transforms our isotope into a brand new isotope, often a totally different Different element than what we had before. So here's the key thing for these kinds of processes. Radioactive decay is always a first order reaction, which means it's going to have a constant half-life time throughout the course of the reaction, which is going to be very useful as you'll see here in a few minutes when we're trying to do certain types of calculations. Now, I have kind of good news for us. You do not need to be able to write these equations uh, for the AP test. This is something that we did in pre-AP that the state of Texas requires us to do, um, but we do not need to know how to do that for the AP test. However, I will warn you, if you're taking the SAT subject test for chemistry, you might be asked to write and balance a nuclear decay reaction. What we want to recognize is that if I see one of these reactions already written, that it would be a first order reaction. Or if they discuss an isotope decaying, that that would be first order. And so therefore it would have a constant half-life time. Um, its natural log versus its time graph would be the straight line. Um, I could use the 0.693 over K to calculate the time. There's all kinds of things I can do once I recognize that it's first order. All right, let's go ahead and switch to the next page where we're going to see some examples. So the first example here says, hey, we have a particle diagram of a reaction initially and at a point two minutes after the reaction began. And then it wants us to draw a particle diagram for what this would look like at various time intervals. So to start us off here, you notice all of our initial particles are here shaded in, which means this is my reactant. And if I count them up, I notice eight total particles. Well, as I go here to two minutes, what I notice is that I'm down to only four of those original particles that we had. And then I also see four particles of something brand new. So again, four stayed the same, four changed into something new. Now recognize that that means half of my substance changed into something new, which means that this underwent a half-life as I changed from zero to two minutes. So therefore our half-life time would be two minutes for this particular process, for this particular reaction. Now, what we're going to assume here is that this is first order. I know it doesn't say it, but if you want to kind of make yourself a note that this is first order, we're going to kind of address the fact that this half-life would stay consistent over time. So let's talk about what would happen at four minutes. Well, that means another two minutes has passed from the two minutes right here. So I went through another half-life. So what that means is that my reactant that's remaining would get halved again. I only had four left here, so if I half those again, that would bump me down to only two of those original particles, um, and the other six here would end up being my new product. So then another two minutes passes. Now I'm up to six minutes. So now another half-life is going to have passed. So what that means is that my reactant that's remaining, my two particles, that's going to get halved again. And so as it gets halved again, that would bump me down to only one of that original particle remaining, and the other seven particles would all be my new product. So you can see how that number just gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you progress on. All right, another common type of question, besides a particle diagram, would be something where they give you a graph and you're kind of having to evaluate 
what order it might be. And so you would kind of need to look at what your half-life times are doing. Here, just ask you, hey, uh, here's a graph. Is the decomposition a zero order, first order, or second order? And so what I would do is look at those half-life times. I noticed to go from 100% down to 50%, that took roughly about one unit of time. I don't know if this is seconds or minutes, but it's one unit of time here. To go from 50 to half that down to 25 took another unit of time. To half 25 down to 12.5 took a, another unit of time. And so I can see each time I'm halving, I'm taking a unit of time, and so since that half-life is remaining constant, then that must mean that this is a first-order reaction. All right, now the next one, instead of giving us a graph, has given us some data. And it says, looking at the following charts, determine which the following data sets would be the zero-order reaction, the first order, and the second order. So if I can, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my half-life times. There is another way to answer this question, and I'll address that here in a minute. Um, but if I look at my concentration of A, I actually don't really care about the other two columns. If I look at my concentration of A, I want to ask myself, how long does it take to half that concentration each time? So like for example here, as I have 8 to begin with, if I'm trying to cut 8 in half, 8 would bump me down to 4. So to go from 8 to 4 took 200 minutes. Well, if I want to half 4 again, that bumps me down to 2. But to go from 4 to 2 only took 100 minutes. So look, I went from halving taking 200 minutes to halving only taking 100 minutes, which means I had a decreasing half-life time. Something else I want to point out is with these regular intervals of time, notice that I was getting very set intervals of change of A. Like it's going down by two molar every single time, which means that if it's I'm having a constant decrease, that this data must be linear. And so what that means is that a concentration of A versus time graph would be linear. And so we hopefully can recognize that as being zero order data. All right, on this one here, as I go from eight to four, that took 100 minutes. As I halved 4 down to 2, that took another 100 minutes. Halving 2 down to 1 took another 100 minutes. Each time I'm halving takes the same amount of time, that 100 minutes. So I don't know about you, but that kind of sounds like maybe I'm dealing with a first order. The other thing I want to point out is that if I look at the natural log of A data, I see constant decreases happening every single time. Uh, 2.08 down to 1.39 is changing about 0.69-ish. Going from there down to 0.693 is again changing by roughly about 0.69. Going from 0.693 down to zero is again changing by about 0.69. And so it's decreasing at a constant rate meaning this data would have given me a straight line. And remember, the natural log of A versus time graph should be straight if we have a first order reaction. Last but not least down here on this one, I have my concentration of eight going and halving to four. That's taking 100 minutes. However, halving four, I would go to two. That halving took 200 minutes. My half-life time is getting bigger. Also, look at the 1 over A data here. Going from 0.125 up to 0.25, that's a constant change in comparison to 0.25 up to 0.375. I'm changing by the same interval. From 0.375 up to 0.5, I'm changing by the same interval. That's a constant increase there. And so therefore, both of these factors would be indicative of being second order. Um, I do want to mention here that people get thrown off when they see this increases and these other two decrease. Remember, that has to do with the formulas themselves. If we think back to these equations here, um, the zero and the first order had that negative k, so that would have been a negative slope there. 
whereas our second order did not have the negative there, and so that would have been indicative of being a positive slope. And so that's why you see that these had constant decreases of their data for whichever one was the linear. And then here we had a constant increase of our one over a data for our linear graph. All right, hopefully you're starting to feel good with uh, calculating with some of these half-life times. Um, we're gonna look at some other examples in our next video where we actually do some math calculations, especially when we're dealing with radioactive decay. If you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye guys.